All right, Jeff, welcome to the Impact Driven Leader podcast. So excited to be with you. Um, before we get going, I, I want to share something. You don't know this. And uh, I think there's only one other person that knows this, and it's a mutual friend, Mark Cole. Oh, wow. And, and I'm going to share this because it's very, it's, it's very pertinent to this podcast. And so I used to host a different podcast, and I kind of had this wrestle. I enjoyed it. And, and I heard podcasts that you were on roughly about a year and a half ago. And, and I texted Mark and I said, man, I'd love to meet Jeff Henderson. Uh, if I got the opportunity to interview him, I would love to do a podcast again. And that was, you know, unbeknownst to you, here I am now, this will be, you know, uh, getting into, I think you're going to be episode 19 or 20 of this wow. iteration in the book club. Uh, and it's exciting to me because we had an opportunity to meet last fall. And that is when at that, and I don't think you know this, at that event is when I decided to launch a podcast. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's cool to get to know you. And so I wanted to start off with that, um, that you have made a difference in my life. And, and here we get to talk now. Well, that's encouraging, Tyler. Thank you so much. And uh, I, I should say my pleasure to all your listeners. So thank you. Thank you for doing what you're doing. And I'm, I'm Honored to be a small part of what, what you're doing. It was great to meet you back in November. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about your book and and really want to get through that. You know, uh, your book, Know What You're For. But most importantly, as I read this book, and I was so intrigued when I read it, and I'm excited for it to be a part of the Impact Driven Leader Book Club where we get to, you know, break it down and really talk about it. And I want to start with this premise. And I think I shared this with you and, and love this as a kicking off point and, and for you to just kind of digest it. My belief is great marketing is great leadership. Hmm. What does that make you, you know, think about? And, and let's, you know, I'd love to jump off there. Sure. Well, I think for, you know, for many people, marketing has a bad connotation to it, you know? And so I think we, we have to be careful with that word in a sense that we're, we're not saying we're trying to get something out of people. We're trying to add value to people. And, uh, you know, our mutual friend and hero, John Maxwell, talks about adding value and that's what great leadership is. It's not about what can I get out of people. It's what can I, uh, how can I add value and serve them? Um, and when you do that, when you have a great message, when you have a great product, it does lend itself to communicating what that is and how you can serve the world. And that's where great marketing comes in. But it really does be begin with great leadership. And it begins with not asking what can the world do for me, but what can, you know, what can I, what can I, organization, whether it's a business, a nonprofit organization, as an entrepreneur, as a podcaster, and a business leader like yourself, hey, at the end of the day, at the end of our life, we want to look back and see that we added, a, added value to people. So when it comes to great marketing as great leadership, I think that's true because I think ultimately uh, great marketing is all about um, adding value to people. I mean, as we're talking about this and just making this very conversational, you and I, you know, chat and, and talk about this, I, I really think it comes back to the virtue of what you said is if I'm looking to add value to people in my position, my role, and, and as a business owner, if I'm looking to add value to people, I'm going to do that internally and externally. I'm going to do that for my customers that are, you know, partners with me in this journey in our team. And I'm, you know, going to ultimately do that externally. And I think you can't have one without the other. And I really believe, and, and as I look at it and you go through and you break it down in your book, that's what's magical. Because if you set your mind there, as you've had great people model that for you, you're going to create this culture where ultimately you're going to have great leadership. You're going to have great marketing, customer service, you know, product, because you can't have one without the other. Absolutely. And ultimately, you know, this, the best gift that you can give your customers is the best version of you. And so there's, there's this symbiotic relationship between I'm going to be for you, but I'm going to be for me, uh, in terms of taking care of myself and which has been really hard for all of us in the, in the challenging year that we've had. And that's why wellness and, and health is really, really important because you can't give the best you have to people if you're not taking good care of yourself. So it's, it's the old analogy, Tyler, but it's still true that when, if the, if the plane experiences turbulence and the oxygen masks come down, you first breathe yourself before you hand mm -hmm. it to the next person. And so I think there is a relationship between being for others, creating a business for others, but ultimately it, you know, emotional health is really, really important. 
because ultimately that's what you're going to deliver to customers. If you want to have a robust customer environment where everyone feels valued and cared for and served and they can tell their friends about it, then you've got to have a, an emotionally healthy staff as well. So, I mean, um, I, we hadn't talked about this and you didn't know this, but I've, I, I've really embraced that my purpose is to help other leaders get healthy too. And, and I think that's physical, that's emotional, that's spiritual, that's, that's all of those. For me, it was coming to grips with my insecurity. It was practicing more empathy. And, you know, so as you lay that out, I, I can't help but think about the two questions that you pose in your book. And it's kind of this whole premise of four is what are you known for and what do you want to be known for? Right. And, and as you have said, the gap in between there is the area you have to work. Well, as you just said that to me, that's, that's a, a red herring for a leader. You know, what type of leader do you want to be? And what type of leader are you really? And it's where do you have to fill that gap? So, you know, let's first start with um, how did you come to those questions? Like what, what was your background where you came to this and like you had to ask these questions? I spent a number of years in the business world. I started in sports marketing with the Atlanta Braves, and uh, that's a baseball team here in Atlanta that consistently <laughs> loses. And uh, come on, I'm an Indians fan. I mean, how many mo how many movies have they made about the Braves being the laughing stock of the uh, major <laughs> leagues? True. They haven't yet, so it's not that bad. Well, and ironically, the only World Series the Atlanta Braves have ever won. Yes, uh, they yes beat thank the you. So there you thank go. you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, in my childhood, pain just bleeds out of my heart. Yes, thank right. you. <laughs> so thank you. That's, thank you for that uh, championship. Yeah. That given us. Yeah, you're welcome. So, we gave to you. Because right. if I recall, we were up three. Yeah, yeah. But don't get me started on the Falcons losing the Super Bowl. I'll, I'll just. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you've made it there. The Browns haven't. Oh, gosh. Well, that's true. That's true. That's true. You can see, you know, Cleveland always has a, the upper hand. Uh, but yeah, so I started with uh, started with the Braves and worked for um, in the in the marketing industry for a couple of organizations. Eventually, wound up working in a Chick Fil A, which is a quick service restaurant company. It's, it'll do sixteen billion dollars in sales this year, and uh, just explosive growth. I transitioned from Chick Fil A. Long story to work in um, church world. Uh, helped launch three churches in the Atlanta area over seventeen years working with North Point Ministries, which is one of the largest churches in America. And the only reason I say that is um, I was with a mentor who said, you know, I was telling him, wow, look, I mean, he's been so blessed to work for these thriving, growing organizations. And he said, well, it's true, but you have a stewardship responsibility. And that is, you need to tell us how did these organizations grow? And I thought, wow, that's interesting. Then he said, if you could boil it down to just a couple of questions or half a piece of paper, that'd be good. So I've been kind of working with these questions for a while. But um, when he challenged me on that, that's, that really ultimately led to the book. And the question, since you've mentioned, Tyler, is number one, what do you want to be known for? And it sounds like a really easy question, but it, it's simple, but it's not easy. Yeah. And uh, when I work with organizations and ask them, typically if it's a leadership team, I'll ask them to write down what they think the organization wants to be known for in a piece of paper. Don't say it out loud. Then I'll collect the pieces of paper and I'll start reading them. And you can start to see the concern among, among everyone's faces like, oh, wow, the leadership team isn't even clear about what we want to be known for. And if there's confusion in the office space, there will be confusion in the marketplace about this. And it can't also be a 17 paragraph mission statement that we came up with five years ago on a retreat that nobody remembers. It's got to be portable. It's got to be memorable. It has to be you know, five or six people down the line in the organizational chart, if you will need to be able to communicate, what do we want to be known for? And, you know, Steve Jobs said this was your unique, you know, dent in the universe. Uh, Pastor Andy Stanley says, what do you bring uniquely different that's unique to your organization? So once you have that, and that's easier said than done, but once you have that, then the second question is, what are you known for? And that's, the, that's not your question to answer. It's the customer's reflection back to you on whether you are delivering on your brand promise in question number one. And as I observed the career experience that I've had and working with other organizations to see their good, good seasons or challenging seasons, I began to notice that when an organization has a season or seasons, when the answers to those two questions match with what they want to be known for is actually what they're known for, then they unlock the most powerful form of advertising 
the world has ever seen, and that it's positive word of mouth advertising. And that's how you do that. You get you create vision carriers. But to your point, Tyler, there is a gap in any organization. The goal of any organization, though, should be to come to work, no matter what your specific job title and responsibilities may be. The good news is we're all doing the same thing. We're all coming to work today to try to close the gap between what we want to be known for and what we are known for. Now, you got to get clear about what you want to be known for, and you need to have some data to let you know what you are known for. And then when you have that, you got to begin to develop systems that allow you to understand how to close the gap. And that's really what the book is about is how to close the gap between those two questions. But the subtitle of the book, I was really excited about because the subtitle is a growth strategy for work, but an even better strategy for life, because these questions aren't reserved for organizational life. They are actually even more impactful for you and me. So if I were to tell you, you know, Tyler, here's what I want to be known for. I want to be known for being a great husband, a great dad, a great friend or whatever. You actually have to go to the people in my life and say, how good of a husband is Jeff? How good of a dad is he? How good of a leader is he? And you would discover that there are some gaps like there are gaps in any of us. And we shouldn't be afraid of those gaps, we sh but we should be aware of them. And once we are aware of them, then we ha should have the courage to, to change that, improve. And as we do, we close the gap between what we want to be known for and what we are known for. You know, that's where I, I, I see tremendous value uh, in asking this is, you know, every business is providing some type of product, right? Product service. And, and that product, you can ask those questions to. And as I mentioned earlier, every single leader, every single person involved in that organization can ask these same two questions is like, what do I want to be known for here at this company? But also, what do people see me as? And, and I really, it, it's like you said, so simple, but yet it's not easy. Yeah. Because what, what blinders do we put on? Oh, you know, I, you know, there's all these exclusions and, and I see this as a great tool for, for not only understanding a business, like really, uh, you know, we, th you share in the book, which I love is, you know, I hob and I hop and it's kind of like, you know, are your pancakes or your burgers? What is it? Right. And when you confuse people, they're lost. Well, as leaders, we sometimes do that too. It's like, oh, I care all about you, Jeff, and your family, but hey, did you hit your numbers? Mm -hmm. Because that's what's important. Mm -hmm. I, you know, if you want to go to your daughter's graduation, well, did you hit all your numbers first? Mm -hmm. And it's like, you can't have that because that gap just starts to widen. Right. And, you know, I think you mentioned the book, and I think is a great point to talk about it, is that trust. Because I, I would guess, I would surmise the smaller that gap, the higher the trust, mm -hmm. the wider that gap, the, you know, the more distrust, the less trust. I, is that true? Yes. Well, you know, again, our, our mutual friend, John Maxwell says trust really is the fuel uh, or the oil of the engine of any organization and the lack of trust, everything begins to bog down. And, and to your point, that's why I put, you know, the, when the international house of pancakes quote here, decided to change their name to the International House of Burgers. And it was a cute video because they could change the B to a, the P to a B and I get it. But, and it wasn't really true. They were just, you know, highlighting their bur hamburgers. And it is fair to point out that their hamburger sales did go up for that season. But that's called a marketing gimmick. And if you want to build your brand on marketing gimmicks, it will have short-term gain and it will have long-term I think damage to your brand and your customers trust because, and I loved, uh, I put this uh, picture in the book where Wendy's uh, tweeted out, can't wait to taste hamburgers from the organization that thought pancakes were too hard. And <laughs> I just, I, 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 you know, kudos to Wendy's a little, little, little chippy there, but uh, you know, uh, but I just thought that was like, okay, that's our perspective. I mean, nobody's going to, you know, t say the best hamburger internationally, is that International House of Pancakes. And anytime, an or let's just stay in the restaurant industry, anytime I go to a restaurant and their menu's 72 pages long, I just think, and I think the rest of us think, you can't possibly do all of this really, really well. You can't source all the best material, you know, the best food. You can't train everyone to do every single one of these well. So you can't be known for everything, but you do need to be known for something. And what is that? And stay with that. And, and I think that's, you know, it's, it's another word for it is focus. 
Um, but I think once we lose that focus, we begin in, in every organization, there is a natural pull to sustaining and protecting the organization. And if we're not careful, we sustain and protect the organization at the sacrifice and risk of the customer. I, I, I see this a lot in uh, restaurants, quick service restaurants, or, you know, let's go, you know, whenever we're able to go back to the movies, you know, if you go to movies for popcorn and they have all the popcorns in the shoot, well, we know that popcorn is not the fresh one, but they're thinking of it as I can just get this popcorn out to you as fast as I can. If you create a lot of hamburgers in the shoot in a, in a drive through you can get them through faster. But if you're not careful, the product, it becomes stale and not as fresh. And it might help you from getting the product out, but it hurts the customer experience. And that's called insider-itis, seeing the organization from inside. So when you're truly for the customer, you have to see it from their perspective. They don't care that there's 72 uh, hamburgers in the shoe to get. I mean, yeah, they want to get through faster, but they want to make sure it tastes great and it's fresh and it's healthy, right? And so that seeing the, the, the business from the customer's perspective is really important. That's why when I worked at Chick-fil-A, I would tell operators, hey, I know it's the busiest time of day, but if you can pull away from the kitchen at lunchtime and stand in the dining room and see what's happening there in the drive through and see it from the customer's perspective, it's going to give you clues about how to better serve and be for your customer. Why do you, or, you know, it's kind of a where, why do you think in your experience now working with, you know, many different organizations really digging into this? Like what lends to people struggling here? Is it the, is it the fear of, you know, if we're too simple, we can't possibly have success. You know, it, it's, it's, you know, and we've seen companies and you talk about quick serve, we, you know, Chick-fil-A is pretty simple when it comes down to it. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and people make fun of them, but they're like, we're so simple. We're great at it. Right. You know, um, in and out on the West coast, they're so simple. They're great at it. And, and I, I feel like, as I see this, that companies and leaders specifically feel like, oh, okay, we need to start like benefit dumping, enhancing, you know, kind of getting, adding that extra page to our menu, because that's what our customers are going to endear as opposed to, uh, something, I don't know where I learned this. It's like, stop, just focus on getting better rather than bigger. Cause if you do that, you will get bigger. Absolutely. I think it's the 80, 20 rule and you know, 20% of our products are going to provide 80% of the revenue. And, but you are saying goodbye to some revenue when you kill products. But I mean, again, I know Steve Jobs ha had his issues, but I, I tell you, when he came back to Apple after mm -hmm. he fired, the first thing he did was reduce the product offerings. And I think that was a brilliant move because he, he was saying, we're, we're just going to sell four things right now. And the longer you go on, that product line it extended, it extends. And even at North Point Ministries, I mean, early on in the early, early days, we didn't do a whole lot because we wanted to stay focused. Over time, we began adding things. And, and that's a natural course of any organization. Mm -hmm. But I, I feel like understanding that when you add something, it's actually a subtraction of the organization if you're not careful. And when yeah. you say no to something, it's an investment because you're saving your margin for, for what you can do. And I think if we're not careful, this is why I think it's really hard for public, publicly traded companies to do this because trying to bounce the quarterly numbers and trying to get a, a quick fix. And so we'll, we'll do something to try to get a surge of momentum for this quarter. It, it you look up and you've now have 17 quarters and 18 different products and, and, you, and you, it's that, it's that chase for, well, um, for the dollar. Well, you start to, you know, as a lot of companies do, it's kind of like, all right, well, we made it through last quarter. And what do we have to do to get more profits next quarter? Well, we got to roll out a new product because that'll spur all of a sudden this, this growth. And you're like, are you just caught into the more to solve the problem as opposed to, man, we just need to get a lot better at what we provide. And, you know, it, it harkens in this conversation as we're talking, you know, Simon Sinek's book, the, you know, the infinite game, it's, you know, what game are you playing? And, you know, I, I would venture to guess between his book and, and what you're laying out and what you're trying to do is 
man, there, there has to be people speaking against it for the best of people, you know, both customers, internal and external. Mm -hmm. um, do, am, am I right in that? Am I seeing that right? Yes. And I think it, the other, the other consideration we have to take is that is the team, you know, if we'll, if we'll stay on the restaurant analogy, you know, you mm -hmm. order, you, you launch a new product. If you've never worked at a quick service restaurant company for, let's just stay on that for a moment. I mean, launching a product, making sure you, you've trained, especially if you've got, you know, franchise organization, there's food safety issues, there's sourcing, there's inventory, there's profit margin. There, and there's just so much training that goes into it. Don't and skimp on the food safety, right? Yes. Don't skimp. Yes. <laughs> You know that very well. That's very personal to me right now, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't do that. And and at the same time, the business has to keep sustaining. Now, I'm mm -hmm. not saying you shouldn't launch new products. You absolutely should. But I, I think the old analogy, the closet analogy, often helps as well. That before you bring in something new to the closet, let's take a few things out. Mm -hmm. And it's easier for an organization to launch new products than it is to kill existing products because i guarantee you somebody even if it, if this product is the worst selling item somebody in the world this is their favorite thing and when you kill it they're going to get really really mad a friend of mine david farmer he's over the menu strategy development at chick-fil-a uh, they were adding new sauces one time and they took away one of the sauces and they killed it and there was this guy that launched this video actually went viral for a little bit he was like, David Farmer from Chick-fil-A Corporate killed my favorite sauce. You know, so so you're going to have people like that yeah. who will criticize you. But if you're adding and never deleting, at some point, you're just going to have a diminishing return. Well, you get weighed down. And, you know, there has to beg of the question, and, and we're going to, you know, stick with this idea of, you know, the two questions. What do I want to be known for as opposed to what do my customers know me for? And I, I, this would be my guess. If you and I are sitting here and we're strategizing, okay, and we have XYZ company, it's like, man, we should probably, I'm just going to guess. I, I've never worked for Chick-fil-A or, or any of those other companies, but I'm going to guess. If I focus on what the customer, you know, views us as, and if I continue to, you know, innovate and add products along that line, I'm probably going to be more successful as opposed to if I completely am oblivious to that and just do what I want to do in, without consideration of the customer. Mm -hmm. I'm going to guess that's when people get in trouble. Yeah. And it's true for entrepreneurs like you and me as well. I mean, if we come up with many times entrepreneurs, what they do is they come up with an idea and then go searching for the problem. And we need to be solving problems from the very beginning. And there are so many ideas out there that never see the light of day because they're not really mm. tangibly solving the, the problem of the customer. And that's why I think in this season right now that we're, we're all in, you know, my friend Michael Hyatt says that even COVID is as terrible as it was with any situation like this, you need to ask the question, what does this season make possible? Yeah. And again, John Maxwell said, hey, as leaders, this is great. Just blame everything on COVID and <laughs> changes, you know, which I think was fantastic. So you've got some you, you got some air cover, if you will, uh, from a leadership perspective to begin to make some changes. And that's what I've been telling organizations. I mean, this book came out pre-COVID, but now that I've been able to get back out and travel and these virtual presentations, I'm saying, hey, now more than ever. It, I think this message yeah. was true before. It's even now more true than ever because you get a chance to, to redefine and you may come right back to say, this is what we want to be known for. But right now you have an opportunity to do that and don't miss this opportunity. Don't, don't, don't let, you know, whenever things, you know, I don't even like the word normal, but whenever things return to whatever it's going to be, you know, leverage the season. And it's not, it's not too late to do that. That's why I'm, you know, I've been, whether traveling or virtual, I'm trying to get this message out as quickly as we can, because I don't want yeah. people to get right back into the business world and miss this opportunity. Well, you know, I'm begged of this is if we, if we sit and wait for that normal, <laughs> I already lost my hair. I don't have to worry about losing my hair, but I'm just, it, it's not going to happen. 
Right. It, it's you, you better take, you, you can't wait and it's going to, it's just not going to, right. our, our world will never be the same. And so if we're waiting for that leadership opportunity, it's not going to come. And I think that's what, you know, sometimes people need that encouragement It's just go do. And it, as you said, so brilliantly, it's like you have air cover. There's a, there's a point of deniability. Well, it didn't work Well, we're still in COVID, but I tried something and I think that's good and be transparent and, and uh, you know, all those things. Um, I want to switch gears because okay. I heard you mention this and it got me real excited. Uh, I, I hear you kind of have like a, another book coming out and it, it's about a little bit about mentoring and leadership. I'd love to know about that because um, yeah, I just, I'll put that there. Open well, it. I just turned 56. And so I've got a lot of the, my friends that I worked with at Gwinnett church, which was where I was from before transitioning to doing this full time. They were all in their thirties. And when I transitioned to the season, a lot of them said, Hey, we'd like to, you know, when we get to be your age, which in, in other words, they were saying, Tyler, when we get to be old, we <laughs> want to be able to transition well in a season like that and still, you know, have a healthy marriage and help the kids and, and all that. And they said something to me. They said, credibility is the new cool. Cause I thought, and I'm not, I, and I said, well, Hey, there's a lot of cool guys out there. Cool ladies you can learn from. And so my 30 something friend said, true, but credibility is the new cool. We'd like to learn from people who are in their fifties and sixties and tell us what to, we should do in our thirties. And when I heard that, I thought, ah, I think that's, I'm gonna write a book on that. So the book's called what to do in your thirties. And it's 30 days to winning the most pivotal decade in your career. Because if you can win your thirties, your forties and fifties and sixties are going to be, are going to be very grateful and say, thank you to you for that. Yeah. That's not to say if you're listening to this and you're 48 and you're having challenges, by the way, we all have challenges that yeah. it's too late for you. But I, I think this 30 something crew, this 30 something demographic is often overlooked. I mean, we focus on college students mm -hmm. and you know, the 20 somethings and, and as we should, but you know, you come into your thirties, you, know, you, you go into your twenties and you kind of, you know, you're skipping with hope and vision yep. and then life has a tendency to beat you up a good bit. Uh -huh. And you come limping into your thirties. And if you're not careful, you can begin to settle in and settle okay. down. And so I'm trying to tell people in their thirties, it, you can still keep dreaming. It's not too late. And, and there's so much that happens in your thirties. I mean, mm -hmm. so much of wage growth growth happens in your thirties. Some of the most pivotal decisions in your life happen by 35. So that's kind of where I'm going. I'm, I'm trying to be yeah. for 30 somethings and I've assembled a little group of 30 somethings here in Atlanta that are, that's helping me and we'll see where it goes. I'm, but, but yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm just in the, in the early stages of it. Well, I, when I heard about that, I'm like, I, I love it. And I, and that's why I'm doing this is, you know, as you mentioned that it's like, yeah, my thirties were, you know, getting punched in the face and how are you going to deal with this? And then, you know, really it was, it was the transformational period for me. It, I, yep. I'm sitting where I'm at now because of that journey. And I love when, when I heard that from you, because I, I look at myself at, you know, I'll be 42 this summer. I never really thought about finding mentors. I mean, reaching out to, to, to get involved with John, you know, a couple of years ago was finding that first mentor. Mm -hmm. And I think if, if I were to give anyone 10 years younger or, or five years younger, those listening, and that's why it's doing this podcast is, you know, find those mentors, find those people that are going to walk with you. Because right. one of the great things I see, and I think you're solving, helping solve some of this problem is that generation myself to, you know, I call it the 35 to 45, mm -hmm. you know, we are the bridge in leadership right now. Really? We are the bridge from the baby boomers to the Gen Z. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the healthier we are to go back to the very beginning, what you said, the healthier leader we are, I had to get healthy too, as, as, as those leaders that you're talking about, the healthier they are, man, the better our society organizations and communities are going to be. Mm -hmm. And it, it's really saying, all right, how can we all be good, healthy leaders and, and, and take the great from the, the older generation, but understand, Hey, those same things aren't going to work for younger generation because we've all evolved and that never has worked. You go back through all the different generations, every, you know, uh, as I've read from different people, everyone always complains when they're in their sixties about the 20 year olds, <laughs> you can go back a hundred years and they were doing it. And it's, we're not going to solve from that, but how can we be healthier? Um, 
is the way I like it. And, and I don't want to complain about the generation. I want to help this generation. Yeah. yeah. And it, it won't be a book of like, look at all my successes. It'll be look at the things I, I failed at. Here's the things I've struggled with. Here's what I learned from struggling with anxiety. Here's, but there will be some, some helpful, helpful op opportunities for me to share. Um, hey, I made a big career risk and took a big career risk in my thirties, but here's how I thought about it. And here's how I approached it. And I think there's some principles that can help you because, you know, when you get in your thirties, serious adulting happens. I mean, it's yeah. one thing to leave a job when you're 24, but when you're 35 with two kids under five and you got a mortgage uh -huh. payment, the stakes are higher. A little and, different. But if there are ways that you position yourself for the opportunity, even if the opportunity has not yet arrived. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm very excited about it. I think this generation uh, needs some mentors like you. And, yeah. and hopefully we're going to assemble a, you know, a lot of people that can help this, this crew. Because I, I really feel like if we can help them, they'll help the world. Well, um Jeff, thank you so much. I mean, it, it's it's the friendship that I appreciate from you and 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 mentors like yourself and and Mark and and John and you know other guys that you've mentioned. And it's it's really saying, hey, uh, my desire is to help and 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 be for something bigger than myself. And um, thank you for being a part of that and uh, being willing to spend time with myself and our audience. And um, man, I I loved your book. I, I'm so glad I, I I said something to Mark. Now almost a year and a half ago, and uh, this day is now here, and, and I appreciate it tremendously. And thanks, um, thanks for helping me get the message out. It, it, it's important to me, and and uh, to hear your story is really encouraging to me as well. And uh, quick question for you: Are you coming to Exchange in Nashville? Oh yeah. Okay. Good. Oh, yeah. I'll see you. Hopefully, I'll see you yeah. before November. Yeah. But um, if, if not, I'll definitely see you then. Yes, we we will make a point to do something. I, I would love to. I. Uh, um, you know, as I mentioned, getting to spend time in Guatemala, I mean, the more time I'm around and, and somebody asked me, it's like, it, it wasn't around being with John. John's great. It, it's being around everyone else that we're all learning together in the process and, you know, that, that mentorship, but yet that, 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 that interpeer. And to me, that's what's so important is that the round table, right? It's that transformation table. That's, right. that's where you grow, man. Absolutely. Well, it's good to see you, man. All right.